I'm going to read from that new novel. Uh, and uh, it's about Chicago. It's about politics. I'm sure you've heard the news lately that uh, Rahm Emanuel has put his hat in for the mayor of Chicago. Um, it's the first time in, in many years, decades, that there hasn't been that there won't be a daily on the ballot in Chicago. And uh, but we're going to go back to a time of the previous daily. Uh, the old man daily uh, died in December 1976, and that led to uh, uh, three mayors in between Daly the Sun. Uh, one, an old white guy like Mayor Daly, and one, a woman. In 1979, was elected mayor of Chicago. Um, that might not happen again for a long, long time. But over the years, one in half, uh, summer half of years, but I'm not sure she had much of a chance. Uh, this is called, uh, it's a, from a series of stories, but it's actually uh, part of this novel. It starts out with a quote from Rudyard Kipling when he visited Chicago. He said, just when the sense of unreality and oppression is strongest upon me, and when I most wanted help, a man sat at my side and began to talk what he called politics. Roger Kipling, how I struck Chicago, and Chicago struck me, of religion, politics, and pig sticking in the city among the shambles. Um, this is called Wonderful People. It's by Jane Byrne. All of it over now, and this not much of a secret, but even so, it's never been told before. Her enemies, my father said, couldn't use it in the 79 campaign because they weren't sure if it would help her or hurt her. In politics, you can't run the risk that embarrassing somebody might actually make them look more human. Voters like a human being once in a while. Not too much human in that game, but a little they can handle. And that's why they love Jane. At first. After a while, she got way too human for everybody. It's not indecent. If anything, it's really sweet, really. And it would be sweeter still if I kept my mouth shut, but why stop now? I've aired a lot worse dirty laundry than this. Jane Byrne, fighting Jane. Mike Royko called her Mayor Boston. She ran against the machine and squashed it, the whole goddamn machine. The machine that gave birth to her. The machine, what was left of it, that she re-embraced practically the day after she sent Mike Boland and packing. Because first you stomp it, and then you make it yours again. Getting votes is one thing, running a city another. So long, you reformers. Put on your goody two-shoes and run, Marty Oberman. Operator, get me Eddie Rodoliak on the phone. He's just going to jail. <laughs> Finally, after 40 years, I am putting him away. My father told me this. My father who spent years on the periphery of city politics. He was a lawyer in the city planning commission. If anybody asked him what he did for a living, he'd say, I make plans, not a lot of plans. But even in the wings, he picked things up here and there. Jane Byrne, the woman who was to become the 50th mayor of the city of Chicago, used to stand on the balcony of her Marina City apartment, Marina City East apartment, naked as a fuzzy little peach, my father's phrase, and make eyes and more at her husband-to-be, Jay McMullen, who'd be standing on the balcony of his Marina City West apartment, also in the buff. <laughs> McMillan was a straggled veteran newsman. My father said he looked more like a hairy coconut than a peach. <laughs> Imagine them, those two unbeautifuls out there on their respective balconies, in the cold, checking each other out with binoculars. Even by then, they'd both been knocked around enough, not a sight to see for most people, but what a thrill it was for the two of them, like two happy grunts eyeing each other from their foxholes on Christmas morning. Luxury apartments, but that didn't make a democratic primary battle any less blood sport of fellow chattering gladiators in Chicago. Brothers killing brothers, but they were in this thing to win. Together, they'd conquer Mike Bolandic or die. Those two were going to be the Romeo and Juliet of municipal government. Bonnie and Clyde, streets and sanitation. Jay once said that he, he'd slept with every girl at City Hall. He'd roll over in the morning and get a scoop. So tell it to me, baby. Is Santorini in the budget office on the take or what? But that was in the daily years, in the bad old days. Now even Jay McMullen's going to behave because he's in love with the woman who's going to be the first woman mayor of the greatest city in America. America? The world. You remember Jane Byrne? Janie in those sexy white heels hanging off that garbage truck? Jane and Jay moving into the into the Cabrini Green and setting out Christmas cards. Thousand brothers, we've been for a week. Mayor Jane Burns Chicago Fest. She couldn't be bought off. That wasn't the problem. 
It was the power so seduced her, the mere idea of it. Not necessarily what you did with it. And what she did with it was messy. Mostly Jane just seemed to tell people off. Oh, how glorious Jane Byrne told people off. She told off George Dunn. She told off Richie Daly. She told off the Chicago firefighters. She told off the Sun-Times, the Tribune, WBBM, the South County Economist. She told off Jimmy Carter. She told off Princess Margaret. Her mentor, the old man, Mayor Daly, had taught her about timing. And in the end, that's what was so off. Because she punched so often. Finally, the only person she hit was herself. So in the end, she lost. First to Harold, and then again to Harold. In 1988, she even ran for circuit court clerk. Lost. And when Harold Washington died, Richie took over where his father left off. And things had returned to normalcy in the city of Chicago, the city of I will, Chicago the beautiful, the magic city of the West. But of all the scraps of what's long been forgotten, think of those two out on their balconies flashing each other, the shadows of two lovers against the rosy, polluted sky. Jane does a little come hither dance in those white heels. Stay there, Jay, don't move, don't come over. Stay right where you are and watch me. And, and then, she runs for re-election in 79. There's a primary fight between Richard Daly, Richie Daly, his son, and a man named Harold Washington, who's a, a great hero of mine, a great hero of President Obama. And President Obama could get a little Harold Washington on right now. Uh, but Harold Washington wins the Democratic primary, which in Chicago means you're mayor. That's a fast. In 1983. Uh, he had an opponent, his name was Bernie Epton, and this is a story about his opponent, Bernie Epton. Epton had a campaign slogan, it's a time list, so it's about three minutes long. Uh, his uh, campaign slogan was, Epton, before it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it starts with a quote um, by Lynetta McLean, great uh, Chicago journalist who um, actually committed suicide during the, those years. Um, and she says, uh, this town, is beset by a wretched plague. He comes to me sometimes in my awake dreams, shouting, shut up, shut up, shut up. Election night, 1983. Maybe it was exhaustion, or maybe the campaign had finally driven him as bonkers as some of Harold Washington partisans accused him of being all along. Because on paper, the man was a living miracle. He won 48.6% of the vote as a Republican running in the city of Chicago. Of course, it wouldn't have happened if the Democratic nominee hadn't been, you know, who. A vote for Bernie Epton was a vote for survival, plain and simple. You want Chicago to become the next Detroit? Cleveland need to run for its money? St. Louis? I was a punk kid in November of 83, watching it all on television. But even I knew that Bernie Epton was a wild-eyed Republican from another planet and a Jew no less. Not to put too fine a point on it, but my mother said we were Democrats before we were Jews. <laughs> and really, is the world ready for another Jewish savior? Especially one so funny looking? It was hard to see Bernie Epton in the role. Epton's lopsided, eggy head, one more thing he didn't want exposed to the world, along with his sealed psychiatric records. <laughs> but that night in Chicago, he was a hangnail from being mayor. And Channel 2 kept going back and forth between Harold Washington's raucous victory party to Epton's bizarre concession. It was hard not to see Epton as some kind of weird-looking white sacrifice. Shut up, shut up, shut up, he shouted at his supporters. They were cheering him on, and Bernie couldn't take it anymore. Because he wanted to talk. He wanted to say something profound. His great-great-uncle was a rabbi from Shearshaw. He had wisdom to dispense. I'm an intellectual, a lakefront, a lakefront liberal Jew, for God's sakes. I never meant for it to get so out of hand. I'm only a human being. Who wouldn't have been seduced by the possibility? God grants you how many chances in immortality. And if there's somebody somewhere out there who holds a title more noble than his honor, mayor of the city of Chicago, we never heard of him in Illinois. <laughs> I didn't play the race card. Other people snatched it out of my hand and laid it down for me. You're going to blame a man for going along for the ride for the good of the city? Win first, heal later. 
if the people in the streets have to call Harold Washington a child molester to stop him from getting elected, then they've got to call him a child molester. Cicero called Catiline a lot worse in the name of, good, in, in the name of for the good of the Republic. Cicero said he murdered his own son and married his wife. He had sex with donkeys. All kinds of unspeakable things. That's politics. <laughs> says to me from beyond the grave, hold it right there, partner, buggering donkeys. Anyway, I said, tax cheat. I never said child molester. I deplored child molester in public. Get your facts straight. And I always said, this election is not about colors. If I thought for a moment that this election was about colors, I wouldn't be standing before you today. My fellow Chicagoans, I will lead you from the desert to the city of hope, to the golden city of your dreams. And Newsweek shouted to the country, to the world, what's going on in Chicago? Tax cheat, child molester, what's the difference? A con's a con. Go get him, Jew boy. Italians for Epinioni, Irish for McEpton, Poles for Epinizinski, Bernie, <laughs> Mexicans for Bernie Cruz. Huh? <laughs> Never mind, just go and vote for the white guy. Bernie, Bernie, Bernie. And I think of you now, delusions thumping down in your head like wet March snow. Jesus or Moses, you weren't even a very good Judas. You're a footnote, Bernie. You will never be a part of the story that gets told and told. And the story is Richie and Jane Byrne, and how Harold Washington made them both look like the machine hacks they were. Because it was Harold who had the class, the elocution, the ideas. It was Harold who kept sending, sending the reporters to their dictionaries. Mayor Contratin, mayor hoisted by your own petard. You, Bernie, were mayor almost, mayor not quite, mayor already forgotten. But let's be honest, who's remembered? And so today that's all I'm doing. I'm only trying to remember you and myself. I used to watch TV upside down, my head hanging off the couch, my feet on the wall. I'm an upside down kid. And it isn't the winner I want to watch. It's not Harold with his salt and pepper hair and his let's all come together for Chicago grin. It's you, Bernie. You. On election night, the loser's party always interests me more. That spirit of chin up, all those dumb balloons hanging up there dreaming of the lease of that slow, victorious float to the floor. And is there anything so beautifully democratic as a concession speech, even when the conceders having a complete meltdown? <laughs> shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> I know what you were trying to say, Bernie, that your heart was broken, and not only because you lost. The world's an ugly, ruthless place, you wanted to say. There isn't nearly enough love around here. Love, you wanted to sermonize into the microphone, in front of the cameras, in front of the city. Love. But how to explain this? Who believe it? I believe it. Mayor regrets. Mayor too little, too late. Mayor tomorrow, tomorrow, the sun come up tomorrow. Amen, Bernie. You and me both. In this, you speak for us all. In this, they should put your name on a plaque somewhere. And so I say, sleep well, Bernie. You were bones in Oakwood Cemetery, 1035 67th Street, in the Jewish section, across the street from Harold Washington's Grand Mausoleum.